Hi. Hi. Ah, there we go. All right. So on the 7th of May, 1959. So on the 7th of May, 1959, Sir Charles Snow gave an influential lecture at, uh, at Cambridge. It was titled, The Two Cultures. In the lecture, he argued that two of the foremost intellectual disciplines of our times, the humanities and the sciences, fail to communicate adequately. And the barriers to communication between the two disciplines was a hindrance to human progress. Since then, these disciplines have communicated on and off, come together, drifted apart. And once again, it's time for the two disciplines to come together to address one of the most significant developments in the history of mankind. This is the rise of artificial intelligence. Over the next few minutes, what I'd like to talk about is what impact this is going to have on a country like India, the developing world. So let's, let's go back a little. What do we know about AI? Right. We've known for a few decades now that machines can learn. Right? No surprises there. In fact, my own PhD, uh, when I was a graduate student, was about teaching optical devices to, to learn so that they can mold light that goes into an optical fiber. And what we achieved by teaching these devices to learn was a 10 to 100 fold improvement in telecom capacity. Okay. This was experimentally demonstrated, and it was time to move on. Machines can see, read, and write. Okay. This is true as of today. In fact, here's, here's something from Google research, recognizing scenes and actually captioning it. Machines can analyze images and in fact can analyze uh, medical images and detect illness. Right? Machines can navigate, we know this, and occasionally they can get pulled over and be given tickets. Right? Machines can build. Here's a brick laying machine. It's a brick laying robot okay, that lays bricks in cement. It does not take breaks, it works 24 hours, okay, and you do not struggle with labor problems. Here's a road laying machine. And, you can, and it can lay bricks in fantastic, fabulous forms that are normally not humanly conceivable. So there are many, many wonderful possibilities with machines being able to do new things. What does this mean for, uh, what are some possibilities for a country like ours? Well, first is lots of cheaper manufactured goods. Okay. Once you automate factories, okay. so let's, let's look at the boundary here. I'm going to stay within machines that, can, that do not require creativity or empathy. And I say that because creativity and empathy, I'm, I, it is not because machines may not be able to achieve that, but, it, but because it is easier to agree that things that do not require creativity or empathy will be easy to algorithmize. Okay. So machines can actually do a lot in factories. And so manufactured goods will become vastly cheaper. Cheaper high quality construction will be possible. Right? We, we just saw examples. People can have houses okay, at significantly lower costs. The supply chains involved in getting the raw materials will be significantly easier, okay, or can be significantly easier, okay, once you have automated procedures. None of this requires any creativity or empathy. Uh, vastly cheaper clean energy is possible because large solar farms can be constructed automatically okay, and lines can be laid automatically. Metering can be done. Uh, one of my pet favorites, uh, ubiquitous healthcare. What does medicine involve? Well, there's diagnosis okay, and then there's therapy and then there's surgery. Diagnosis is fundamentally a decision-making process. You look at data, decide if a person is ill or not, and if, if the person's ill, what kind of illness? Something that machines excel at. Therapy, again, is a, is a decision-making process. What, what course of treatment 
is likely to maximize the probability of a favorable outcome. And surgery as well. Right? So, outside of medical research, typically medicine does not require any creativity. And in fact, at Embrace, we are working on developing a, um, artific an, inter an artificial intelligence-based diagnostic system to help babies okay, and detect illness in them automatically for remote rural areas. Tremendous possibilities in healthcare. Law enforcement. Okay. We just heard the previous speaker talk about challenges in law enforcement. Well, once you have ubiquitous sensors, right, images being captured, things being recorded, I'm not arguing that you should have robocops. Okay. But even, even if you just have digital data being captured, you will have recorded evidence. And the ability of criminals to walk away with impunity will be significantly lower. Matters for a country like ours. And finally, the public distribution system, right? the rationing system. Can be complete. It is possible to completely automate these systems to minimize wastage, pilferage, corruption. I am not arguing that this will happen. These are all things that can happen. Lots of wonderful possibilities. In fact, we are talking about a situation where machines will be able to do most things better than most people. Take a second to gather that. Not saying all things better than all people, but most things better than most people. In a country like ours, what does this mean? A, something that does not require creativity or empathy, a lot of jobs will get replaced. We're talking about construction, stop, construction jobs disappearing, possibly. Driving, uh, manufacturing, delivery, the list is countless. What can this mean for a country like ours, where the vast majority of the population does not engage in labors that require either creativity or empathy, okay. which is what makes the developing country context different? What is likely to be the pol political fallout of this? To analyze this, we have to go back to one basic notion, which is jobs. So the notion of a job that as a means of earning an income for the majority of the population is actually a relatively new notion. Okay. We are very used to it, okay. employment, and earning an income from employment. But for this to be the norm in society is actually a post-industrial revolution notion. Before that, what we had was primarily a feudal system, not just here, but in most countries across the world. Okay. What we had a feudal system where uh, people were affiliated with a household, or at a different level, they were affiliated with courts, and, the, and they provide patronage in exchange for their labor. So what we hold as sacred, the jobs as income, needn't necessarily hold. In fact, countries are, uh, there, are, uh, there are folks already trying experiments with this. Once you have a situation of abundance, when it's possible to actually provide certain essentials at very, very low cost, is it possible to give everyone in the country a living wage? That is one possible pathway. Give everyone a living wage. Their essentials are taken care of. Okay. And dissociate income from jobs. Scandinavian countries do this to a large extent. Unemployment wages are sufficient to actually live comfortably for a certain period of time. Okay. In fact, Y Combinator is running an experiment on this to understand the impact okay, of, um, of a wage provided. Is this necessarily the right thing for the country? I don't know. Okay. Because fundamentally, you, you reach the question of, after a living wage, what will be the purpose? We will be in the situation of the idle rich, okay, where the essentials are taken care of, and we have lots of time on our hands. There will be a percentage of the population that will engage in creative and empathetic pursuits. How large can that percentage be? Okay. It's anyone's guess. And what will the rest do? We have a challenge here of human capital. Right? So what will the, what will the rest do? Um, 
I don't have an answer, to be honest. So there's a second possibility that can play out in a democratic context, which is the idea of a walled garden, regulations. Prevent these technologies from coming in, okay? or impose regulations. Control them so that you don't have social upheaval. Now, we impose these walled gardens does not mean that the rest of the world is actually going to engage quite the same way. There will be other countries, especially countries where the majority of the population has the ability to engage in creative or empathetic pursuits, okay? especially smaller countries like a Switzerland or a Singapore or the Scandinavian countries or in Israel, okay? and they will progress. But this is, this, is a, this is a possible reaction in a democratic context. Where does this lead? I do not know. Okay. But I want to leave you with questions as young technologists. One, there is one, another eventuali eventuality that is highly likely to play out, though, okay. which is the question of creative and empathetic machines. I stayed off that question in the interest of agreement. But already we know that machines do have the capability to be creative and empathetic. And let's understand why. Okay. Creativity is nothing but the ability to form novel combinations. Painting is the ability to form colors, shapes, objects, ideas in new ways. Music, the ability to sound notes, Groups of notes, instruments in new ways. Creati creativity in music. Creativity in the sciences, in mathematics, is the ability to piece together axioms and the rules of inference together in new ways to form new understanding. So creativity is actually a generative process that involves piecing together things in novel combinations. And you know what? We have creative machines. Artificial creativity already exists. They are nowhere near human level. Uh, empathy. Empathy is the ability to respond to another person understanding the other person's emotional state. And how do we understand another person's emotional state? It is based on past experience. It is based on reading the other person's body language. It is based on reading the other person's language, tone, and so on. You know what? A machine can do all of these. And it act actually, it can do many things that I can't. For example, sitting here, okay, if I had, I had the capabilities of a machine, I'd be able to, I, I would be able to tell not only all of these things, but I would be able to look at, I would instantly know all the publicly available information about this person that is available on Facebook or Instagram or any of these settings and have context. I'll be able to look at the person and measure his or her pupil dilation, breath rate, Pulse rate, okay. and no, uh, no far more than a human being is able to sense. And we already have empathetic machines. And uh, empathetic. Here's an example of uh, machine creativity. Um, Google actually recently uh, showcased art forms created by machines. Here's a case of machines being able to identify emotion. This is from Microsoft. Okay. And it's able to correctly identify surprise. Where does all of this lead? Eventually, there is like with progresses in neural implants that are already happening and genetic modification, there will be a time when we, we are faced with the choice of do we actually augment ourselves with machines? Do we augment our, do we augment our memory? Do we augment our processing capability? Do we actually plug into the internet? All of these questions will come up. Edward O. Wilson, um, a Harvard biologist, um, wrote the Pulitzer Prizing piece of work, uh, prize winning piece of work on human nature, in which he talks about sociobiology, the genetic predispos predispositions that gives us human nature. And at the end of the book, he asks the question, asks the question very presciently. When we reach a situation where we are able to change our own nature, what will we do? We have reached that point. And the two cultures have to come together to answer this question. Thank you.